Hello everyone, Dr. Ross here with chapter four of our GOB Chem 51 course. The topic of chapter four is covalent bonding and molecular compounds. The contents of this talk will be covalent bonds, just the basics of covalent bonds. Covalent compounds, we'll mention some formulas and how to name them. We'll look at Lewis structures of covalent compounds. Then we'll look at types of covalent bonds. And then we'll finish up with the SEPR theory, which is an acronym for valent shell electron per repulsion. Okay, so what is a bond? We'll only consider bonds from a classical perspective in this, um, in this course. Uh, there are quantum mechanical um, descriptions of the bond which are more accurate, but the classical description will be um, enough for us in Chem 51. So if you look at this diagram on the left, you can see uh, we have a graph, energy is on the x-axis, and then there is really no y, sorry, energy is on the y-axis going uh, vertically. We don't really have a label on the x-axis, so really we just have two objects that can go up and down in energy. If we look at the top left here, we've got two blue spheres, and then we have two red spheres. You can have two blue spheres next to each other with no interaction or no bond between them, and that would have a certain amount of energy. However, what changes when a bond is formed between these two blue spheres the difference between having a bond versus just being adjacent to another sphere is that your energy is reduced. So two blue spheres next to each other, they can lower in energy and that indicates the formation of a bond. The two red spheres here can lower in energy, indicate the formation of a bond, but it's a different type of bond. So this is how we would represent an ionic bond. So two elements come together to form ions. The ions then pull together because of opposite charges attract, so via Coulomb's law. And that attraction, that bond, lowers the energy of the whole system. The blue spheres here don't have the ions, so this would be a covalent bond where we share electrons rather than exchange electrons in the formation of an ion. Um, so in this regard, we can think of a bond as a label when a composite system lowers its energy. Um, what else can we say about the bond from this perspective? Uh, oh, why does it lower energy? Well, imagine you have to undo it. Imagine you have to break the bond, or you'd have to invest energy again. Um, so imagine you're trying to lift something out of a hole, you invest energy. Well, likewise, if we want to break this bond, we have to lift it up out of an energy hole. Okay, so bond, the basics. Um, bonds are the driving force for atoms to form compounds. And what happens once they form compounds, each constituent atom in the bond is isoelectronic with its nearest noble gas. The word isoelectronic means same electron configuration, um, which I think was in a previous video, I think chapter three. So um, if two, if, um, if, the, if the objective of elements when they form bonds is to become isoelectronic with an oval gas, then we have a motive for the bond formation and this also allows us to understand what we mean by lowering the energy. So there's different visuals you can have here. So the lowering the energy, so that if you break the bond, you have to hoist uh, the object out of the energy pit it's fallen into. That's one visual. Another visual, if when the elements become iso, if when the elements form a bond, they become isoelectronic with a noble gas. 
then to undo the bond or to break the bond, you've got to convince them to not be isoelectronic with a noble gas anymore. And that's going to cost energy because you've got to wiggle electrons. The noble gas, recall, um, is the group 18 in the periodic table or the group that's on the far right side of the periodic table. So bonds, whether they be covalent or ionic, the objective is to lower the energy of the system. For main group elements, that's essentially the S block and the P block, or groups one and two for the S block, and then groups 13 through 18 for the P block. They form bonds to become isoelectronic with the noble gas. And they can do that by either sharing electrons, as in a covalent bond, or exchanging electrons in an ionic bond. In fact, the word covalent comes from cooperative valence electrons. So cooperative just means sharing. Here is a nice cartoon of a bond. So on the left here, we have a hydrogen atom. So we can see it's single proton nucleus. This shading around with the one E, that just means we have one electron. So this is a cartoon of what the atom looks like. Here's a Lewis dot representation of what it looks like. We've got H with a dot. Here the dot just means the electron. When two electrons, when two hydrogen atoms come together, remember hydrogen is a main group element. So it wants to become isoelectronic with its noble gas. And the noble gas of hydrogen is helium. So helium, we know from the periodic table, has two electrons total. So you just need to buddy up with another hydrogen. So here on the right, we see two hydrogens. Uh, one H and a dot is from the hydrogen on the left. Another H and a dot is from the hydrogen on the right. They come together. You can see that the electron cloud here overlaps. So we have these two electrons being shared between the two hydrogen nuclei. We can represent the two dots as a single line, and that means we have a single covalent bond. Um, one more thing we can glean from this visual, uh, we can see that there's an attraction between charges here as well. So the positive proton in the hydrogen on the left is attracted to the electron from the hydrogen on the right. Vice versa, the positive proton in the hydrogen on the right is attracting the negative electron from the hydrogen on the left. So they both want the other atom's electron, and that's another visual way to think of the interaction or the bond between the two hydrogens. Okay, this is a nice diagram. Because it shows you um, an energy profile as a bond is formed. So imagine that A and B are two atoms. Imagine A is static. And imagine that atom B is going to move from right to left until it's touching A. Notice the axes, we have energy as the vertical y-axis. We have distance between the atoms A and B on the horizontal x-axis. So again, imagine A is static. So A is a single element. It has zero rest energy. Sorry, not zero rest energy. It has zero energy and that just means, it doesn't mean it's at rest necessarily, it just means it's not being influenced by B at this point. B is off at infinity, so A is not being influenced by B. B is also at zero energy. B is off at infinity, not being influenced by A. We're now going to keep A fixed, and we're going to bring in B from right to left, and initially, we're going to follow this, uh, this orangey looking line here where it says attraction. As B gets closer, at some point, we're going to go to negative energy. 
And that is because, like we said um, here, when we lower our energy, that's evidence of a bond, a stable configuration. So that same idea is here. We're lowering our energy, and that is an attraction because to undo that, we would have to raise the energy, and that's an energy expenditure needed to break something. So therefore, we know that an energy lowering is the building of a bond or an attraction. Okay. However, we also know, so that's just looking at the, the RNG line here, there's an attraction. We also know that at some point, we're looking at this blue line here, which is a repulsion. As the two atoms get close to each other, they realize they don't like each other. So A is surrounded with at least one electron. We don't know what element it is, but it has electrons on its exterior. B also has electrons on its exterior. And as the electrons come together, they repel because of coulombic repulsion. So this is this repulsion. Now, as they keep, let's say they're being repelled, but they are forced, let's say they're mechanically forced together. Well, eventually, the nuclei are going to be repelled. And the nuclei are going to be repelled, um, let's say, more forcefully than the electrons would. Um, so eventually, this repulsion is going to asymptote. So we've got two competing interactions going on. We've got the repulsion in blue. We've got the attraction in orange. So if we combine those two together at all points in space, we get this gray resultant profile. So the gray profile is the sum of the orange attraction and the blue repulsion. So now we can, we can ignore the blue and orange lines. We can just look at the gray. So you see that there's a net attraction. There's a net maximum attraction. And then there's a net repulsion that asymptotes away as the two nuclei start to make this each other. So what happens is, now you can imagine B is just a ball. The ball is gonna roll into this pit, into this potential well, this energy well, indicated by this blue arrow, and that represents uh, the bond. So we have a bond length. Remember the horizontal uh, x-axis is distance between atoms. At some distance between A and where B is going to end up, there's a bond length. And the bond can vibrate a little bit. The vibration would just be thought of as B uh, jostling around in the bottom here, going up and down as the, the, the rings of this slope. So B can oscillate, so the bond length can vary slightly. But it's definitely stabilized by an energy uh, deficit. So if you wanted to break that bond, you would have to push B over to the right side of the diagram again, and you would have to spend energy breaking the bond to lift B up again out of the well it's fallen into. So this is a nice visual uh, to complement our idea of a, this mechanical idea of a bond. Okay, there are types of bond. Uh, this is a uh, whole structure of a compound. And you can see we've said earlier, see if I can find the right slide. We said earlier that we can represent a bond as a pair of electrons. And for convenience, rather than have two dots, we can just represent it as one line. Remember that one line equals two dots. So we call a line a single bond. We can always replace it with two dots, two Lewis dots, which represent electrons. So for example, around this carbon, we have um, eight electrons. So that means that carbon has eight valence electrons and is isoelectronic with neon. Hydrogens each have one bond, that's two electrons. Hydrogen, you look at every single one. Hydrogen, in every case in this molecule, is isoelectronic with helium. We can have double bonds. This would be four dots, so two pairs. 
But still, if you look at this carbon there, similar to this carbon, it still has four bonds, but rather than four single bonds, it's got two singles and a double bond. Nevertheless, it still is encased in eight valence electrons, so it's still isoelectronic with uh, neon. Likewise, this carbon is isoelectronic with neon. How about this triple bond? This is the third and final type of covalent bond that we'll see in this course. So this triple bond, we still have four bonds total around carbon. Rather than four singles or two singles and a double, we have a triple and a single bond. So that's four total. Triple bond is now three pairs of electrons. So the three pairs here and then the one pair over here, that's four pairs total, that's eight electrons. So again, even in a triple bond, the carbon is isoelectronic with neon. That's the objective why elements can form bonds to begin with. They are stabilized if they become isoelectronic with their noble gas. Some covalent compound uh, formula names. So there's two, uh, well, really there's one rule, maybe two rules if I try and split that into two, for naming covalent compounds. First of all, covalent compounds are non-metals only for the most part. So non-metal and non-metal. So here we have nitrogen and oxygen, they're both non-metals. Sulfur and fluorine, both non-metals, phosphorus, oxygen, both non-metals, and then finally carbon and oxygen as these five examples. The family convention for naming covalent compounds is to use prefixes. So we uh, are recommended to know the prefixes one through 10. So one is mono, two is di, three is tri, four is tetra, five is penta, six is hexa, seven is hepta, eight is octa, nine is nono, which coincidentally is grandmother in Italian, but that's irrelevant here. And 10 is deco. Okay, so I would advise that you memorize those. That's rule number one. Rule number two, use prefixes everywhere except don't start the name of a compound with a prefix. Unless, sorry, you can start the name of a compound with a prefix, just not mono. Okay, so for example, we've got two nitrogens and four oxygens over here. So two has the prefix di, four has the prefix tetra, and then we have to say two nitrogen, so di-nitrogen, and four oxygen, tetraoxide. Now in English, we don't like two vowels together, so rather than tetraoxide, we drop a vowel and just abbreviate the two tetroxide, the dinitrogen tetroxide. One sulfur and six fluorines. Uh, we don't say mono, that's the rule, the second rule I told you. Rather than mono sulfur, we just say sulfur. And we have six fluorines, so we say hexafluoride. Notice the, pre, uh, the suffix for the last element is always uh, the IDE suffix. So the first element, so let's say these are binary compounds because there's two types of elements. The first element just has its regular elemental name. The second element has the prefix of its elemental name and the suffix is IDE. So dinitrogen tetroxide, sulfur hexafluoride. We've got two phosphorus and five oxygen diphosphorus pentoxide. Again, rather than pentaoxide, we drop a vowel, pentoxide. One carbon, one oxygen. We don't start with mono, so just carbon. And then again, instead of monoxide, we drop a vowel, monoxide. One carbon and two oxygen. Carbon, we don't say mono, and then dioxide. Lewis structures, uh, we've already seen Lewis dot structures for ionic compounds. 
So here again is representative of period one, two, and three. Notice that down groups, we have the same Lewis dot structures for each member of the group. Rather than exchanging Lewis dots as in ionic bond formation, here instead, we are going to um, share Lewis dots. So for example, here we've got two hydrogens with their one dot. We have oxygen with its six dots. Oxygen has vacancies for two more dots. So those vacancies are filled by each of two hydrogens. So if you look separately, we have eight red dots total. When they come together, they're all centered around oxygen. We can redraw the dots between atoms as a single line. So the pair of dots between hydrogen and oxygen on the left become a line. The pair of dots between oxygen and hydrogen below become a line. And then we're just left with the two pairs of dots that don't share another element. This clears up the diagram a bit, and we can see now we have two bonding pairs, and we're left with two lone pairs. Hydrogen is isoelectronic with helium. Oxygen is isoelectronic with helium. Hydrogen can form a similar compound with nitrogen. Nitrogen has its five dots. Hydrogen has its one dot. So they come together. If you count total, we have eight dots total. They come together centered around nitrogen. We can replace the bonding pairs between hydrogen and nitrogen with a, a just a line. And we're left with a single lone pair on nitrogen. Clearly, nitrogen is surrounded by eight electrons and is isoelectronic with neon. Hydrogen is isoelectronic with helium. Likewise for carbon. Carbon is now sur surrounded by eight electrons. In this case, they are all bonding electrons, so we have no lone pairs. All members of this compound are isoelectronic with their noble gases. We can form double and triple bonds. Here with carbon dioxide, we see the four dots of carbon. We see the six dots of oxygen. They come together, and by forming double bonds, carbon has access to eight electrons, which is seen clearly if we replace the bonding electrons, those two pairs between oxygen and carbon, by two bonds. Now you can see the carbon has two bonds on either side. So it's got four bonds total, which it always likes. And those four bonds are eight electrons, which means it's isoelectronic with neon. Each oxygen forms two bonds, which it likes. And it's also got two lone pairs. So in total, each oxygen has access to eight valence electrons. It also is isoelectronic with neon. Triple bond, two nitrogens come together. Triple bond between them, lone pair on each nitrogen. The triple bond plus the lone pair is eight. Each nitrogen is isoelectronic with neon. Uh, We've got more examples here where we've got double bonds and single bonds. So in short, the objective for you as a student is to look at the Lewis dots that the constituent elements have, ensure that when you rearrange them, you make sure that each element has access to however many electrons it needs to become isoelectronic with its noble gas. Redraw all dots between elements as lines, as bonds, remain, uh, preserve the dots that are just lone pairs, and then you should, if you follow those rules, get a real uh, Lewis compound. Here are space filling diagrams and contour plot diagrams um, showing the flavors of those covalent compounds. So if you look on the left, we have two hydrogen atoms, and we can see that the electron density is shared equally between them. 
because both hydrogens have the same electronegativity, they have the same strength, and their ability to pull electron density towards themselves is the same. So it's completely uniform. Fluorine is slightly bigger than hydrogen, so we see a larger um, contour plot here. But again, it's symmetric because each fluorine is exactly the same strength as the other fluorine. Not so when we have H and F. H is lower electronegativity than fluorine. So as the arrow suggests, electron density is being pulled in the direction of fluorine. We see that in the color contour. We have this bulging of the profile towards fluorine. We have a color coding. Here, red indicates higher electron density. Higher electron density, red, or the head of this arrow, or the delta negative symbol, which means a partial negative charge. Lower electron density, blue, or the positive tail end of the arrow, or a delta positive end here. They all mean the same thing. They mean unequal sharing. So whereas HH and FF had equal covalent bonding, and we label that nonpolar covalent bonding because there are no separate poles. Here with HF, we would say polar covalent bonding because there is clearly a difference in the ends of the bonding. We have two separate poles. This compound, there's no difference. This compound is different. We have the arrows pointing from hydrogen towards oxygen. There's no opposing arrows. So we have a net increase in the electron density of oxygen shown in red here, a net deficit in electron density around hydrogen shown in blue here. Once we have one consequence of this polarity across a molecule, is that the molecule can stick to an adjacent molecule. So for example, in this cartoon here, the electron rich oxygen end of one, ox of one water molecule is being attracted to the electron deficient blue end of an adjacent water molecule. And we know macroscopically, this is why water is wet. This is why water sticks to its neighbor and it has high physical properties like boiling points because you would have to break these interactions to liberate water in the gaseous form. Finally, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Um, you would be expected in the GOB class to know just these compounds. So if we have, so first of all, what's the SEPR? Valence shell electron pair repulsion. A valence shell is the outermost energy level. Electron pair, that's just a pair of electrons. Repulsion, electrons repel because they are light charged. So this repulsion of electrons around the central atom gives a three-dimensional geometry. Most of the time, sometimes it's only a, a one or a two-dimensional geometry, but it gives a geometry nevertheless to a molecule. So for example, if we have an AX2 system where A here represents the central atom and X2 represents any non-central atoms. So an example of an AX2 system would be beryllium dichloride or even carbon dioxide that we saw earlier. This would give a linear structure with a 180 degree bond angle as a way for A to minimize the repulsion in electrons between the two X's. For three, uh, for three, uh, a three system. So we have AX three. A is the central atom. We have have three non-central atoms. It can either be three non-central atoms or two non-central atoms plus a lone pair. So here the E just represents a lone pair. Uh, either way, they would have the same geometry. They would have a trigonal planar geometry, which is like, um, I guess, a Mercedes Benz trademark symbol. Um, so 
this is a circle split up into three portions. So that means the bond angle is 120 degrees. If we were to replace, if we had this 120 degree bond angle, but we had a lone pair, there's a convention that says when you give the electron structure, you look at everything. So they both have the same electron structure. It's trigonal planar because it's a three-sided object and it's completely two-dimensional. So it's a plane, so it's trigonal planar. But the convention says that when you give the geometry, you ignore any lone pairs that are on the central atom. So ignoring that E, what we're left with just looks like a bent line. So we, although it has trigonal planar electron structure, we would say its geometry is bent. What if we had four around the central atom? That would be tetrahedral. Um, we could have AX4 because we have four elements. We could have AX3E because we have a lone pair. And as an example, ammonia here has a lone pair. We could have AX2E2 because we have two lone pair. An example would be water with its two lone pair. Because they all have four electron groups around the central atom, they all have an electron structure, which is tetrahedral. However, when we look at the geometry, the four elements are give it a tetrahedral geometry. The three elements and one lone, lone pair give it a trigonal pyramidal geometry because it's a three-dimensional pyramid. Uh, not a pyramid as in an Egyptian pyramid, but this is just like a tripod pyramid. So it's got three. So basically it's sat on its three X's and the A is, is the, the fourth corner of this pyramid. So a three-sided pyramid. And then again, the ignoring the two lone pairs on the central atom, we have what looks like a bent line. So we just call it bent. And that ends this video. Hope it was helpful.